Public Schools First North Carolina believes that school diversity still matters. So pushing back on the resegregation of our schools is a battle worth fighting. This is the fourth part of a series highlighting North Carolina's history of school diversity and honoring North Carolinians who contributed to the cause of Black education and school integration. Part four, the resegregation era. When you look at the bigger picture, it's evident that education has been segregated for most of North Carolina's history. There were two eras of improvement, the first after emancipation during Reconstruction and the second during the Civil Rights Movement. In part four, we will focus on the resegregation that has occurred since integration efforts were phased out. After integration reached its peak around 1988, North Carolina schools began resegregating in the 1990s. For example, this is what West Charlotte High School's senior class looked like in 1985. And this is what it looked like 20 years later. Educator diversity had been on the decline for decades, since a large percentage of Black educators had been forced out during desegregation, and those who stayed had often experienced prejudice and systemic barriers that deterred younger generations of Black students from choosing the profession. The number of Black administrators had begun to rebound, but overall, North Carolina's teachers, principals, superintendents, boards of education, and other state education leaders were still disproportionately white. In the 1990s, the North Carolina General Assembly had reorganized the Department of Public Instruction and State Board of Education and passed the ABCs Act, which put more pressure on educators to ensure their students met achievement and growth targets. The C, increasing local control and flexibility coincides with the rise of the school choice movement in North Carolina. Private school enrollment grew and the first Charter School Act was passed in 1996. In the years that followed, there were, as predicted, a number of white flight charter schools established, but surprisingly there were also black flight charter schools filled by black students whose families were frustrated with lack of progress on the achievement gap and other equity issues in their existing schools. To give the new charters more time to adjust, the state initially waived the rule in the Charter School Act that requires a charter school to reasonably reflect the racial makeup of the community it serves. Black flight died down when charter and voucher schools didn't deliver on the academic outcomes those families had hoped for. And along with the cap on the number of charters in North Carolina being lifted, they have drawn more and more white students over time, and recently more Hispanic. Despite charter schools continuing to be racially disproportional or isolated, the racial balance requirement remains unenforced. So the overall effect of the growth of private and charter schools has been to increase segregation, because it throws off the proportional balance of the school relative to its community. Many white students are in schools with large numbers of non-white students due to the influx of Hispanic and Asian families to North Carolina, though there are likely to be fewer black students and more white students in their schools than is representative of the local community. At this point, the conversation shifted from racial equality to economic disadvantage though the two are connected due to historical discrimination and cultural bias. During the 1990s, there was a push for new support programs like Smart Start, and in 1994, five low-wealth counties sued the state of North Carolina for violating their students' constitutional right to public education by using a funding system that relied too much on local property tax values. The North Carolina Supreme Court's decision in Leandro v. State in 1997 generally defined the right to a sound basic education, the specifics of which are still being debated today. Leandro does not require the state to ensure students in every district get equal funding for education, though a follow-up case clarified that the state must provide districts extra funding if they cannot meet the needs of their exceptional students who require extra resources. This led to more statewide clarification on the requirements for special education and enrichment for AIG students. 
At the turn of the 21st century, while the nation grappled with one crisis after another, the Supreme Court and federal court system rapidly released districts from desegregation plans and busing policies. Though there were warnings about the long-term consequences, most Americans had moved on from school integration. Since the 1970s, the court had maintained that its authority only applied to a temporary period of transition, and districts did not have to repeatedly prove their unitary, desegregated status over time. Further, it decided school systems that were likely to resegregate once the court order was lifted would not be required to fix it if it was a result of de facto segregation, like white flight, and not the district's intentional discriminatory actions. In the 2002 Belk v. Charlotte-Mecklenburg decision, the court ruled the district had reached unitary status so busing was no longer necessary, effectively repealing SWAN. Charlotte provides the perfect case study for the result of the court's integration decisions. These maps show the long-term impact of redlining policies during the Jim Crow era. Despite federal housing discrimination laws passed in the late 60s, decades of redlining has had a long-term effect on how Black families can build home equity and pass it along to their children. Studies consistently show that a school's A to F report card grade is more of a proxy for its average student's socioeconomic status, or SES, than anything else like teaching practices or administrative policies. Nor does it reflect student intelligence, talents, or potential, but it is related to factors that impact student academic performance like access to quality pre-K, family health, and residential stability. And due to historical discrimination and persistent de facto housing segregation, schools with lower SES tend to have a disproportionate number of black students. Low wealth schools receive extra state and federal support and often show significant growth. But because North Carolina uses an unnecessarily strict formula that weights performance 80% and growth only 20%, it penalizes these schools. Since a neighborhood's associated school report card grades are featured prominently and families with school-aged children consider it a major factor in where to live, it has a kind of new redlining effect on the real estate market. With court-ordered desegregation plans phased out, in the early 2000s, the Federal Department of Education focused on measuring and closing achievement gaps for historically disadvantaged subgroups of students. North Carolina native psychologist Edmund Gordon, who was already known as a co-founder of the Head Start program, was a national leader in research to explain and eliminate achievement gaps. Though support of federal policies like No Child Left Behind, later changed to Every Student Succeeds, was bipartisan, there was strong disagreement over testing methods and the consequences for schools and educators if they failed to make progress. The same was true at the state level with the ongoing oversight of Leandro compliance administered by a Superior Court Judge Howard Manning, so the case returned to court. Federal court decisions did reaffirm the value of diversity goals during this time, but its increasing restrictions on methods of achieving diversity steered policy in the direction of non-punitive initiatives and incentives like grants from the private and public sectors. After SWAN was repealed in 2002, districts that had unitary status already could still voluntarily consider race to maintain diversity, especially if they had once been under court order. In the landmark 2007 Parents Involved decision, the Supreme Court set strict limits on the use of voluntary race-conscious school assignment. For example, if there's any metric or method other than race that can be used to maintain diversity, such as socioeconomic status, it should be used instead. Fears of lawsuits following the decision caused most districts to steer clear of using race altogether from this point forward. In North Carolina, Wake County Public Schools replaced its race-conscious student assignment policy with one that balanced schools by socioeconomic status instead. It met the parents-involved standard 
while still achieving greater racial diversity than returning to neighborhood assignments or freedom of choice plan. Despite national recognition for its success, a political upheaval on the school board in 2010 resulted in a plan to abandon that system. Outcry from families, concerned citizens, and the NAACP drew national and international attention. This is when Great Schools in Wake was founded, which led to the establishment of Public Schools First NC. After backlash resulted in another overhaul of the school board, a kind of middle ground was created that allowed for greater school choice, but was more controlled to maintain diversity goals. In response to the growth of private and charter schools, public school districts like Wake County ramped up magnet programs to provide a wider variety of school options within the district. Districts often choose more segregated or economically disadvantaged schools to convert to magnet programs. A magnet school may still be disproportional to some extent, but the balance is much better than before it became a magnet. In this table, you can see that the biggest difference between magnet and charter schools is the percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch, since charter schools are not required to provide transportation. Resegregation trends are clear and supported with multiple methods of measuring school diversity. Top education researchers across the U.S. track school diversity trends and provide updated reports for national and state level data. The increasing number of majority schools of color is to be expected, since according to 2021-22 data, non-white student populations have grown to make up more than 45% of the school population. And there are some cases where hypersegregation may exist for a reason, such as the Cherokee schools in the Kuala Boundary Reserve, or schools for Islamic students who follow strict prayer schedules and dietary guidelines but there are also still some small private schools founded as segregation academies in the 60s and 70s that are still virtually all white. The claim of resegregation is evident here in the increasing number of black students attending schools that are intensely segregated schools of color, meaning 90% or more of its students are students of color. It is also common for white families to perceive that their district schools reflect their community demographics even when they don't, or to attend a school that is diverse in some ways like race and ethnicity, but disproportional in others like SES. After two decades of returning to neighborhood and school choice assignment policies, you can see that for every category, the typical North Carolina student attends a school where their own race is overrepresented. For example, in 2021, the typical black student attended a school that is made up of about 41% black students, when the black student population in the state is only about 25%. And the typical white student attends a school that is nearly 60% white, even though white students make up only 45% of the state's student population. Private education is the least diverse. Though they only make up 45% of the North Carolina student population, white students make up as much as 77% of private school enrollment. This table shows how many more white students are using vouchers to attend private schools every year. The dollar amount provided by the voucher program is about the same as the average tuition at a small religious school. Most of the taxpayer money going to private school vouchers in North Carolina ends up in Christian schools, many of which have very selective and discriminatory acceptance and expulsion policies. North Carolina has the least regulated voucher program in the country. Voucher-funded schools do not have to provide transportation, special education, or free and reduced lunch. Many of these schools only accept Christian families refuse LGBTQ plus students, and have rigid behavior and dress codes that tend to be biased against racial and ethnic minorities. School choice and privatization proponents leading the North Carolina General Assembly have been systematically underfunding public education for years. Due to a notorious record of gerrymandering, 
they have been able to suppress widespread and vocal opposition from minority populations, educators, and other public school supporters. Despite a multi-billion dollar surplus and profitable education lottery results, these legislators have refused to fully fund the Leandro Remedial Plan that was agreed on by all parties in the lawsuit and mandated by court order. The still unfunded parts of the Leandro Plan would provide more resources to low wealth districts and schools to provide better support for children with disabilities, English language learners, those who are at risk for dropout, or who are economically disadvantaged. North Carolina has become one of the worst states for per pupil funding, and our teacher pipeline is in critical condition. There are many ways implicit biases and systemic racism separate students or stifle diversity. Unequal access to high quality pre-K education. Lack of educator diversity, so students of color almost always have white teachers. Biased discipline practices that remove students of color to in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, alternative schools, or even prison. And all of those factors causing more students of color to be held back, chronically absent, or at risk for dropout. Biased placement of more students of color in special education and fewer students of color in AIG honors and AP courses. De facto segregation of higher education due to generational inequality of opportunity and wealth. These kinds of persistent racial inequities were brought to mainstream attention in 2020 due to the intersection of the pandemic and Black Lives Matter protest. So more attention has been given to the school resegregation problem nationally but the school choice movement continues to grow and North Carolina education has become bogged down with culture wars focused on opposition to anti-racist or woke teaching, expansion of DEI programs, affirmative action policies, gender issues, and book banning. So how does this history relate to our current situation in North Carolina schools? School choice proponents should be careful of what they wish for Study the history of North Carolina's educational system in the 19th and 20th centuries. North Carolinians across the state increasingly wanted a more consolidated, regulated, and state-supported system. There was general consensus that this would make education more efficient, stable, equitable, and supported by the best education expertise the state had to offer. The only significant opposition to this had to do with racial segregation, not educational quality or progress. The considerable breadth and depth of national research available on school diversity was made possible by the increased school data reporting system initiated during the integration era. This is how we know that in many cases, when you control for factors like SES, Students in charter and private schools don't do any better, and sometimes do worse, than comparable students in traditional public schools. Public charter schools aren't required to be as transparent as traditional public schools, and North Carolina's voucher program exempts private schools using taxpayer dollars from any meaningful data reporting. If this continues, there will be no way to hold school choice proponents accountable for their claim that charters, private schools, virtual schools, and home schools result in better outcomes for students. Traditional and fully accountable public schools can also provide choices like magnet programs, early college, and specialized academies. In a Southern state with a history of de jure segregation or segregation by law, and persistent de facto segregated neighborhoods, school integration will always be challenging unless we make it a significant and permanent investment in policies that promote integration. And for those policies to be successful, we have to keep talking about it and listen more to what families of color need and want. We also have to show white families who think this issue doesn't affect them that it does. Decades of social science research has shown a wide variety of measurable academic, economic, and social benefits of integrated schooling in K-12 and higher education, including higher test scores, more complex thinking and communication skills, and better preparation for working with diverse clientele. 
And these benefits were seen for all students, not just those of color. And North Carolinians all benefit from the impact this has on our social, economic, and political systems. Learn more about school diversity at publicschoolsfirstnc.org. If you missed parts one through three, they are also on our YouTube channel. See the video description below for a full list of references and sources.